got to do is we're going to do it the redneck way. We're going to honk our horns, okay? So how many of you are glad you saved? Say amen or honk your horns. There we go. Are you used to it now, Allison? You better get ready. All right? So here we go. Now listen. Uh, oh, my gosh. That was your mom right there, Allison, by the way. Uh, just FYI. That was, uh, just say amen, Tara. That'll be all right. Are, are you okay if Jack sits with you? Okay. Hey, stay right there. You're just, it's just the vehicle. <laughs> All right, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. This is like any other chapel service. I want to see if we can hear you. All right, all my kids, everybody, parents, if you know what to do during chapel service, we're going to start out with Ain't God Good. Ain't God Good. I can't hear you. Ain't God Good. Somebody figured it out. They honked their horn, all right? Very good. Listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn this group loose to sing uh, something I want to say right off the bat. And this, is, uh, this is our last chapel service of the year. I know things didn't kind of end the way we expected them to or the way we wanted them to end or, or how we had planned for them to end. And uh, we thought there for a second we was just getting an extended spring break, which was really cool, and then all of a sudden, uh, boom, everything was kind of taken away from us, and you kind of learn what you miss when you start to, when it's when it's taken away from you, and uh, one of the things that we realized that we was missing a lot of, and that was our chapel services on Fridays. Uh, if you've been a part of chapel services over the past few years, you begin to learn that that has been a uh, that has been a, just a, a safe haven for all of us, the teachers, the students, the people who come in. God has just decided to pull that out and anoint it over the last few years, watching kids' lives get changed, watching kids and teachers and parents and family members come to an altar and, try and, 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 and renew their lives and get restored and get help and get encouragement. It's just been an awesome thing. But what about uh, six years ago? It was about six years ago. Uh, the young lady, Allison, that's going to sing tonight, her and her brother uh, started singing and chat. They come up to, I didn't even know they sang until their mother, who was in the yellow Jeep back there, let me know that they, they sang in church. And, and I said, well, that's great. Let's start doing chapel services. And, and so they started, doing, uh, they started doing the song that most of the kids call the Squish Squish song. And uh, that became real popular. And then all of a sudden it turned into a, uh, turned into just, worship and I've watched Allison and Will grow and God used them in a mighty way and uh, we're going to miss them we're going to miss Allison and Will uh, especially and uh, their their willingness to sing and always be a help to our chapel services I never will forget about two years ago somewhere around the two year mark one of the things that I've never done in chapel was I've never really given an invitation before and uh, Allison was singing and uh and God just failed. And as God failed, kids started coming to the altar. And as they started coming to the altar, it was it's chapel started at 8. And at about 10.30, we were still having chapel. Or was all over with seven or eight kids had gotten saved. Kids were getting saved all the rest of the day into, the, into their classrooms. I was moving around. I, uh, I remember a whole, uh, uh, an entire second grade class walking into their classroom. Every one of those kids were on their faces, literally begging God not to cast them into hell. And uh, scared me to death. I thought I, I thought their second grade teacher was beating them profusely. I mean, that's how they were crying. And uh, so, uh, so God's just anointed these chapel services over the last few years, and we're we're grateful to be able to do this. I know this is a different chapel service than what we're used to, uh, but it seems like everything we've done here lately has been quite different. And I've been okay with that. Uh, I like different, and uh, change is not something I'm uh, really bothered by. So. We're going to bow our head in prayer. We're going to celebrate our seniors tonight. We're going to recognize them at, uh, before the end of this service is over with. We want to make sure we recognize our seniors. Um, one of the things that stink is uh, they didn't get a chance to really practice and perform their senioritis like I think they wanted to. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think there was still some senioritis that they wanted to get out of their system. But God has blessed this school with a great group of seniors and a great senior class, our biggest senior class, and uh, we want to honor them and recognize them tonight. But at the same time, I want us to worship the Lord. I want us to enjoy His presence. I want us to just, if you feel led to lift your hands and, and sing, if you know the words of the song, sing with it, 
stand up if you want to. Um, so however you feel led to do this, um, I promise you this, it ain't going to bother me. Let, uh, with this past Sunday, these rocks right here became an altar. Uh, there was people, we had folks get saved and uh, folks get right with the Lord and they got up, they had gravel on their knees, but they had a clean heart in the process of it. So feel free if you need to, to use this little area of gravel right here as an altar. It's open for you to use anytime you want to. Let's bow our heads in prayer, and then I'm going to ask this group to get up and sing uh, for us tonight. Y'all worship the Lord and just, uh, just enjoy His presence this evening. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be in chapel this morning, or this afternoon, rather. I thank you for these children. I thank you for this school. I thank you for what it represents, all the hard work that has went into it. Well, whatever what the, the, the season that we've had to go through and endure over the last few months has been very unusual. Sometimes there has been a spirit of fear. Sometimes there's been a, fear, a spirit of frustration that has run through all of us. But God, uh, you have just saw fit to keep us together. You have saw fit to let us be used. And you saw fit to bring us here tonight to be able to worship you and to celebrate um, the last day of school at Mount Pleasant uh, for the 2000. Uh, 19 2020 school year so god i pray that we're able to just turn loose and just uh, worship you in spirit and truth i'm asking you that you would pour yourself out into this place fill this place with your presence god fill us with your spirit and god may you just anoint it and breathe on it uh and, and god we will be sure to thank you we'll be sure to praise you and give you all the glory for everything in jesus name amen
us him in worship. That's all we have to do. We don't have to try and fight on our own. I love this song because that's the message of this song. Do you
this is my last chapel that I could kind of say whatever I wanted. And personally, I don't want to say anything, so I could like throw up standing here right now. Um, but I was kind of reflecting on like what this ministry has been for my life. Um, he said like five or six years ago is when I first started doing this. And this is the first place that I was ever put in any kind of ministry leadership um, like this. And so this will always be really special to me because this is just kind of where I started, where I came from. I'm really thankful for this opportunity and for all the people that have walked with me through my spiritual growth for the past few years because I've come a long, long, long way from where I was. Um, but I was thinking about the platform that I was given through this ministry and how we're all kind of given um, platforms of all kinds of sorts, whether your platform is a flatbed trailer or your booth at a restaurant when a waitress ruins your order and you're starving. You all have a platform of some some sort or another. Um, and I feel like I took for granted the platform I was given for the first several years of this, and I really, really, really regret that. But when you realize stuff like that, you repent and you move forward. Acts 3.19 tells us um, to repent of your sins, turn away from them, and God marks them out and gives you a season of refreshing. And that verse has become kind of one of my favorites because it doesn't just say that he marks it out and that's it. Because if you have a list and you draw a line through something, it's still there. You can still see it. You still know it's there. But he gives us a season of refreshing. He gives us an entire new slate, something totally clean. And none of that is in his remembrance anymore. And repentance doesn't really give us amnesia. We don't forget our sins because we repent. But repentance is about realizing that that sin doesn't matter anymore. And that you can move forward in the way that God intended you to to start with. Um, and so I feel like this past year, I really kind of stepped into, you know, what God really wanted me to do for him and through this opportunity I've been given. Um, and I hope and pray that, you know, something I've done has been of worth to him over the past few years. And I just want to encourage all of y'all to be aware of the platforms you're given, be aware of the opportunities you're given because we all have them no matter how much you want to ignore them because I'm really good at ignoring them and I promise some of y'all are too. And that's not the way God wants us to be. That's not the way we're called to live. Um, so I just want you all to prayerfully consider the opportunities you're given and consider, you know, who your platform is, what, what position in your life is your platform because we all have them. And... Um, you know, I'm just thankful that God remains faithful even when I'm denying the calling that he's put on my life or when I'm not really taking advantage of the platform that he's given me. And so this next song, um, it says, Even when I'm not, you're faithful. Even when I doubt, you're truthful. Even when I'm lost, you won't let me go. When my heart is dry, your grace flows. No matter where I run, I'm not far from home. I may be weak, but you're able. Even when I'm not, you're faithful. And I love that chorus because... All those years that I spent running from God's calling and I wasn't faithful to the person that he wanted me to be, he remained faithful. He kept giving me chances, kept giving me chances, and now I'm here kind of closing this chapter of my life. And I just hope that somebody now, uh, maybe the beginning of a chapter for you, you can see that opportunity that he's given you and you'll be faithful to it before it's years down the road and you regret what you didn't do in the past. So y'all just worship with us on this last song and thank God for how faithful he is to us.
depths of the sea. Even there, it's your hand that will lead me wherever I go, wherever I go. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your face? Where can I flee from your presence? Where would I go? Where would I go? If I rise to the heavens, you lead me. If I fall to the depths of the sea, even there it's your hand that will lead me wherever I go, wherever I go. Even when I'm not your faith. I say amen. Amen. Yeah, there we go. I said I say amen. There we go. I wished I could sit here and tell you that this was preparing for tonight was an easy thing for me to do, uh, scripturally speaking, because so much that I could say that I would love to say and uh, it's been on my mind and on my heart, but I've got to, I got to obey the Lord and share with you what the Lord has told me to say. And uh, I, I can't, I would be, I would, I don't think I would be doing the Lord justice or us as a group justice by just sitting up here and ignoring uh, the lessons that I think we've learned through this season that God has allowed us to go through. The one thing I do know is this, is that nothing in this world has ever happened that has taken God by surprise. Amen. Never has sure. anything ever taken God by surprise. 
I would love to be able to sit here and tell you that me and God have agreed on everything that he's allowed to happen, but I can't sit here and tell you that me and him have agreed on that because we haven't. Matter of fact, I can tell you some strong disagreements that me and the Lord has had, but it doesn't mean that I, <laughs> that I was right uh, because he is right. Several months ago, God put me in the book of Revelation teaching on the Laodicean church. I did not know that I did not know what the Lord was preparing my heart for as a pastor, nor what he, I think he was preparing our, our country or our county for, was when you look at the Laodicean church, it makes an indictment against that church that says you, you, you have said that you are rich and in need of nothing, but the reality of it is, is you're naked, you're poor, and you need me, and, um, I know that we've probably never verbally come out of our mouths and said, hey, we don't need you, God. But if you get right down to it, doesn't hasn't our actions said that? Hasn't the way we've lived our lives just haphazardly, carelessly, the things that we have put value on that mean absolutely nothing, some of the things that have been taken away from us, I, I'm amazed at what God has taken, allowed to be removed from our lives. And you guess what? We're still here, and I think we're probably better for it. Matter of fact, at the very beginning of this, this season where things started getting a little crazy, I, I was, uh, all right, we're, we're going to shut school down for two weeks, and that's going to be all well and good. We're going we're gonna to go through a little two-week spring break, and praise God, I could use a two-week spring break. And uh, couldn't we all? And uh, we were all about that that, that tipping point. And uh, then all of a sudden, the March Madness got shut down. Well, that got interesting, didn't it? And then the NBA shut down. And then that got real interesting. And they were thinking, well, what's going on? And then you start to kind of wonder what God's, what what's happening right here? Sports gets completely shut down. And then next thing you know, within a few weeks, we're not even coming back to school. Uh, church even looks different because they have recommended to us that we not go inside our buildings, but we maintain social distancing. And so therefore we're having church at church services in our car, which I want to go on record and say I never in my wildest dreams would have thought I'd be getting an amen from a honk horn on a platform, uh, on a flatbed trailer. Uh, but it's, but I live in Blount County, so I don't know why that would surprise me. But at the same time, I think the Lord was teaching me and teaching all of us a great lesson. You say you, you said with your actions that we don't need you or don't need God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the things that you hold and precious and I'm going to kind of take them away from you and watch you still function and actually grow in me. I'm going to take away the travel ball and the sports and the I'm going to take away the academics in a, in a lot of ways. I'm going to take away the classroom. I'm going to take away. I'm going to take away the buildings that we have church in for just a little while, and let's see what the church does when it has to step out of its box of tradition. Let's see what the students are going to do when they're required to do some things on their own without having the teacher breathe down their neck. Let's see what's going to happen with you when you don't have a when you don't have a trophy to pursue or a or an A plus to get. Let's see what's going to happen when all of that when all of that is taken away from you. All you're going to be left with is me, and let's see how much you grow after that. And over these past few weeks and past few months, God has really taken me deeper into my study, and I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very thankful for the work that the Lord has done in my heart. This past Sunday, I preached out of Matthew uh, five six and the Beatitudes on what. Uh, on blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I got, a, got us to a point where we begin to examine what are we hungry for? What are we thirsting for? What are we longing for? I still believe that there are some that are trying to pursue relationships and said, if I can just get this person in my life, then I'll be fulfilled. But only to find out that even when you get that person in your life, they're not always what they or it turned out to be, and you find out that that relationship with that boy or that girl did not necessarily fulfill the void that you thought it was going to be. If I could just get this job or get this scholarship or get this, uh, get this opportunity, or if I could just make this amount of money, or if I could just get this place or get this car or get this house or get one of these things right here, then, then maybe, maybe that will find fulfillment. But I've, I've, I've come to the realization 
that what we as American citizens describe as being blessed is not necessarily what the Bible dictates and defines as a true blessing. I'm real thankful for my home, but the fact of the matter is, as you get right down to it, all these things that we identify like cars and things and buildings and stuff like that, we can be thankful for the usefulness of them, but the reality of it is, is let's be honest, they carry with them burdens, do they not? Your cars may be nice to drive, but don't they need maintenance? Your car, and every now and then, about once a month, they seem to want to be paid for, don't they? I mean, that carries a burden with it, doesn't it? And that burden makes you have to go to work and you have to labor just so you can make that payment, just so you can drive that car. And you say, well, God's blessed me. But the reality of it is, is maybe we can be thankful for those things, but are they truly the blessings that God defines for us to have in the Word of God? Because He says the person that is blessed is the person that is not hungering and thirsting after things, but He is the person the person that is hungering and thirsting after the righteousness. That word righteousness means to have a right standing with God. And the question to, to myself and, and to all of us is, are, what are we counting our blessings? What are we identifying? His blessings. And when was the last time, when was the last time we actually thank God for His mercy, His grace, and His forgiveness? Because it is in those attributes of God that we can truly be thankful for. It is that I stand in the favor of an Almighty God that is the blessing that has been poured down upon my life. It is the fact that His mercy has kept me alive long enough to experience His grace. That is what a blessing is in my life. I'm blessed this morning not because I drove a car here. I'm blessed this morning because God's favor has rained down on my life. I'm blessed this evening because I have been forgiven. I'm blessed this evening because I have experienced His grace. I have walked with His grace. And one day, praise the Lord, in His time, I will die in His grace. Come on, now, here's my question. Jeremiah teaches us as a nation, as he taught the, 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 the children of Israel as a nation, he says this in Je Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm kind of taking you through my week's journey this week for a moment, just what God's taken me through. Then I'm just going to share with you what He's put in my heart. And I want to find out what we're holding on to and what we've created in our own lives. But in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse number in verse number 11, he says, Hath a, hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? He uses the word lowercase gods, by the way. Has a nation changed their gods? In other words, what are we worshiping? Let me go ahead and help you right here. You worship the things you apply worth to. I'm going to say that again so you'll remember that. We worship the things we apply worth to. The things that we obey. The things that operate as our taskmaster. Those are the things that we worship. It could be your reputation. It could be, it could be your, your athleticism. It could be your academics. It could be money. It could be, it could be a career. It could be one of those things right there that you are trying to apply so much work to. But the reality of it is, is you're chasing after something that is bringing nothing but emptiness. And I kind of have to go with what the, what, the, what, the, what the wisdom of Solomon says. It's vanity and vanity and all is vanity. In other words, it's vapor, it's emptiness, and it's adding up to nothing. And I'm afraid we're chasing smoke and we can't even get a grip on it. And here's God. He has removed everything. He's taking everything and He's isolated us. And I, and I even asked this question in the middle of it. I said, you reckon God's trying to get our attention? Yeah. And then it's like the Holy Ghost shook me and He says, no, I, He says, you've got to be awake before I can get your attention. Yeah. So it made me remember He's not wanting our attention. He's wanting us as a group of believers to awaken out of our sleep and start living for Him again. He's wanting us to honor Him with our lives. He's wanting us to hunger and thirst after being right with Him. He's wanting us to live a holy life that is right before Him. We've got to quit looking at the acceptance of the crowd and the, uh, and the acceptance of people and learn to be accepted by a thrice holy God. I would rather have God's approval on my life than man's acceptance any day of the week. That may look different in some eyes, but here's the thing. He says, has this nation changed their gods to the point it's not even a God? It, it, to the point there are no gods. He goes on to say, he says, but my people have changed their glory. That's an indictment. 
for that which doth not profit. Did y'all hear that? My people have changed their glory for that which it does not profit. It's not worth a dime. It's not worth anything. What you're pursuing and what you're putting on a pedestal, it's not worth it. That's not my words, that's the Bible. Don't get mad at me, get mad at the Bible if you're going to get mad at something. He says, be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. You may put that in that. They've tried to find fulfillment and forsaking the only thing that can offer fulfillment. Correlate this with John chapter 4 for just a second. The woman, the Samaritan woman at the well came up. She was an adulterous woman. She was, she had been married five times, and the one she was with right now uh, wasn't even married. She wasn't even married to. Jesus told her everything he ever did, but the one thing he didn't do, uh, he didn't condemn her. He said, if you knew who, who, who he was talking to, you'd be asking me for living water. And before the conversation was over with, she got a dose of living water. And the Bible says she dropped her buckets, took off running. Why? Because she no longer had to drink. She no longer had to drink from the well of relationships. She no longer had to drink from the well of religion. She no longer had to drink from the well of reputation. She was able to drink from the redeemed cup of the Almighty God that offered her something that no man could ever give her. And she went running back to a city to say, come and see, come and see. What this man told me, I'll be changed forevermore. And the fact of the matter is, is we have forsaken that. We've run from it. We've forsaken it. We've turned from it. But this is where I really want to home in on tonight, before it starts getting dark. It says, and you've hewn, and you've hewn out, or made, or created, or fashioned, Broken cisterns that can hold no water. A broken cistern is a vase or a vessel. He said you've created or you've hewn out broken ones that hold no water. In other words, you try to fill it up, and yes, it just empties right back out again. You try, to, you try to make something out of it. You try to get fulfillment out of it, but only to look inside. Every time you put something in it, it's back empty again. Some, some would say that's a life of addiction. And I would say, yeah, you try to fill it up, and yet you look inside of it, and there it is. It's empty. Some would say use, the word, use religion. You try to fill it up, but yet you look inside of it, it's religion. It's empty. Because God doesn't want religion. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. Amen. So here's some things I want to talk to you tonight about. Just some things to assess as we move out of this one season into another. And God, even in the midst of all this craziness, God's been good. God's been faithful. Can I tell you something that I've watched God do that a lot of people think has stopped happening? God hasn't stopped saving people because we had three saved this past week, one over the telephone. We baptized four in a, just, a, uh, just a few weeks ago and about to baptize again. So the one thing I've learned about the Holy Ghost is He's not worried about a car window. He really isn't. He can go inside one. Matter of fact, a couple of times in a red light, he's moved inside while a song every now and then was going on, and I felt him in the middle of the... Some of the folks down the, that was passing me may have thought I was a little weird, but they saw that I was having a good time. Amen. But I want to talk to you tonight just a little bit about these broken cisterns. And just trying to identify what some of them may be. And I think we get caught up even, even as young people, even as children, we get to a chance and... A lot of times, I'm afraid this, a lot of times us as parents make them and our kids are holding on to them. We pa we, it's almost hereditary. We, we as parents create, their, we as grandparents create this broken cistern that's holding no water and then we pass it on to these kids. As a ball coach, I watch it happen a lot because a lot of times I see parents trying to live vicariously through their own children thinking that since I couldn't make, a, make it, uh, since I couldn't get all of this, then maybe my, maybe my son or my daughter can. And so I'm going to hand down them a broken sister. And they're going to try to get all the trophies and all the accolades and all the recognition that they want. But the fact of the matter is, is it's just a, it's holding no water. 
It's not giving us any substance. And a lot of times us as parents are passing this on to our children. And we need to realize it. We need to stop it. I want to speak to the parents and the grandparents for just a second. I'm begging you. And I'm, I'm sitting here and begging myself at the same time. May God help us as families to fight battles and quit passing on brokenness down through the lineage of our children. Let's stop the chain of sin. Let's stop the bondage. Let's break the chain so that our children can walk in freedom. Because here's the thing, if we don't show them God, if we don't show them who Jesus is, then we're going to raise a generation that will never see revival because they won't be able to find God because we put Him on the back burner. Because we're trying to hold cisterns that are holding no water. If I could just make this amount of money, I'll be happy. Listen, the most miserable people in the world are wealthy people. I'm not saying that this stuff ain't a bad thing, but I'm telling you right now, there's more to it than that. These broken cisterns, I wonder how many of them we have in our life. I, I wrote some of them down. I wrote some, some of them down. One of them... One of them is the, the, the broken cistern of performance. Entertainment. God help us all. We have become an entertained generation. We have become so entertained because it's, a, it's, a, it's performance based. Let me say this, it happens within our church, churches as much as it does anything. It's based on performance. I've got to put on a show. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. The reason that performance is a broken sister is because the fact of the matter is, is it, it, when you start trying to get people by entertaining them and trying to bring people in your life by performing for them, then you're going to have to put on a next back stack in order to get them to stay in your life. Let me repeat that just a second. You, treat, you keep trying to put on a performance to bring somebody into your life, then you're going to have to keep performing in order to keep them in your life. Yeah? That's what happens. I've seen it. In my own life, I've seen it. Because eventually they're going to get bored with you because you've tried to perform in order to earn those acceptance. And, strat and now you have this broken cistern in your life that's holding no water. And yet you keep performing. It doesn't matter where you go, what you do. You're trying to gain that acceptance of performance and popularity and prestige because you think, you, they think you've got to put on some sort of front in order to do it. But the reality of it is, is you're wearing yourself out because... You keep having to perform in order to keep those people in your life. Listen, if you've got to work for somebody to stay in your life, young people, let them go. Amen. Let them go. One of the greatest lessons that I've learned and one of the hardest lessons I've learned, and this is going to sound real tough and it's going to sound real mean sounding, but one of the greatest lessons that we can learn in our lives is this, is people are not permanent. People are not permanent. They leave, they move, and they die. It is a reality that we all going to have to swallow at some point in time. And listen, if you're having to all, if you're having to kill yourself in order to have somebody accept you, you're wearing yourself out and all you're doing is trying to fill a cup up that's broken. Let them go. If they want out of your life, walk. Let it go. God bless you and maintain the, don't burn the bridge, but let them go. Amen. People are not permanent. And yet we've got this, we've got in our mindset, and I see it in young people so much. And the crazy thing is, is now we've got this, 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 uh, this, this demonic thing called social media out there that is causing kids more and more and the next generation more and more through TikTok and Snapchat and all this other jargon and junk to have to perform in order to be successful. I'm going to say this out loud so that the world can hear. Social media is a broken cistern and the more you try to get likes, the more you're going to realize that it's an empty cup that you keep trying to fill up. It doesn't matter who likes your, your meme or who likes your self or who likes your duck face or who likes your statements what matters is the fact that are you approved by God Amen. come on with it yeah. carnality is another broken sister we have embraced it matter of fact I would say this that we have drank carnality like most people would go through a bottle of Dasani water 
to the point where we have even welcomed it into the bride of Christ. It's almost as it's almost as if today we walk in this sense of we walk in this mindset of, of, of I've got to be just a little bit carnal in order for the world to see relevance in my life. Oh, please help me. I've got a I, I, uh, the, the, we got those we've got those sayings that, uh, that that got those cliches that are out there and and I've watched it as as preachers. Uh, a mock holiness. I've watched it as as so-called Christians laugh at immorality and they scoff at it. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to be real and we're not supposed to be relevant and we're not supposed to be held accountable. But what I am saying is this: is no, we don't need to make a joke out of sin. We don't need to we don't need to make sin out to be something that we can't have victory over. We don't need to live in a reality uh, of making sure that we just we've got to be just enough carnal so that the world will like me. Listen, if you're truly saved, you are a pilgrim in this land. This place don't belong to you. We don't even belong in this world. We're a new creature in Christ. We are just passing through our world. We have been made new creations so that we are welcome and at home in heaven. But I'm afraid that when some of us die, we're going to be awful worried because we're not even going to feel at home in the very place that God has called us to be. We stand in the midst of glory or we're going to look around and say, I don't feel at home here. Or are we going to stand in the midst of this world and say, I would rather feel at home in heaven and feel at peace with my heavenly Father than to feel at home in this world right here. You see, we're holding on to this. We're holding on to this broken cistern called carnality thinking that if I can just hold on to this little bit of carnality, I can hold on to this little bit of immorality, I can hold on to this little bit of sin in my life, and it'll keep me accepted, it'll keep me relevant, it'll keep me locked in with the good group, with that one group. But the fact of the matter is, is carnality is a broken cistern that you keep filling up, but it keeps emptying out because sin is a great taskmaster that wants to rule your life and to steal and to kill and destroy your life. Don't go there. Throw that broken cistern out the window. Let God create something in your life called holiness and piety and purity and a right standing with Him so that you can have something that is filled because the blessed person is the one that longs and hungers for righteousness. <laughs> Carnality. Performance. Popularity. The thing about it is, is all of it is vanity. I know this is going to bother people, but somewhere along the lines, we're going to print up t-shirts that said, Dan Boatman bothered me, and that'll be all right. But I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm, a th I I'm going to tell you something. It's probably going to, that's going to kind of probably ruffle some feathers a little bit, but I'm going to say it because I think it's biblically true. I believe the, the, the concept of the American dream is a broken system. The concept of the American dream is a broken system. You know why I think that? And you know why I believe that? It's because it does not align to what my Bible teaches me. The American dream says you have to, uh, to have and to be and to do and in order to possess all these things, if you can just make a lot of money, you'll be happy. If you can just have all the power and all the popularity, you can, have, you can be happy. The reality of it is, is happiness is not found in those things. The faster you chase that dream, the faster you realize that you'll keep chasing it the rest of your life and never find fulfillment. One of the reasons I know this thing is because when I start asking young people, what do you want to be? What do you want to be when you get older? What do you want to do when you graduate from school? What do you want to do? Uh, what do you want to be when you get out of college? I want to do this and I want to do that. Well, and then the next question I ask them, why do you want to do that? Well, because you make X amount of dollars doing this. You can, you can make that. How many of you have ever heard that statement before come out of a young person's mouth? You know why? It's because we as a generation of parents and elder, older people have passed that cistern down to the rest of the generation. 
I am going to stand and say I'm real thankful for a man by the name of David Hall. He was my offensive line and defensive line coach in high school. He looked me in the eye. This is the most. This is one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. Probably could have been a doctor if he wanted to. Instead, he decided to be a school teacher. Coach Hall had one of the greatest. I had the greatest group of teachers in the world, but Coach Hall had a major impact on my life. One of the things that I always saw about Coach Hall is he loved what he did. And he looked at all of us one time in an, in an English class as, a 12th, as 12th graders, and he said this. He said, I, he said, you can pursue whatever you want to, he said, but the reality of it is, is when you wake up in the morning, you better be glad you're going there. You better be happy when you get there. And I said, what makes you happy? He looked at me, and he said, I get to go to school every day and get paid for it. He said, this is the most awesome thing I've ever done in my life. Could have been anything. Could have done anything. He was smart enough to. But the reality of it is, is he taught me a great lesson that happiness is not found in your bank account. Happiness is found in being able to fulfill your purpose for the Lord. Happiness is found when you find that God is satisfied and pleased with your life. Happiness is found when you realize that you're pursuing Him rather than pursuing something that is never going to offer fulfillment. Young people, please listen to me. If there's a broken cistern in your life right now, all you got to do is just repent. Just like Allison said, just repent, get it right. If there's a broken cistern, if there's a broken vessel in there that's holding no water, it may be one of relationships, one of popularity, one of one of addictions, one of uh, one of uh, of something on social media, your cell phone, or something like that. It may be you're pursuing something and you're realizing all of a sudden that you're not so. This pursuit is cha it's just. It's just like chasing your tail. You're just running in circles all the time. My challenge for you this evening is this. My challenge to all of us is this. is Let's get something that's going to hold water in our lives. Let's get something that's going to hold value in our lives. Not just in this world, but in the world to come. Many times I think we try to chase something. I, I go. I just walked by just a minute ago in that little lobby right there and looked at all the trophies that are in there that we've earned from band achievements to uh, academic achievements to basketball achievements and all of that other stuff. And I got to thinking to myself, one day these trophies are going to have to be thrown away because they're going to be broken. Sure, it was good to get the accolade, but do they hold the value that we think they do? Are we using, as I said, are we using the platform that God has given us to fulfill His purpose in our lives? And that is to glorify Him with our lives. What we're going to do is I'm going to let this group sing one more song and then we're going to, we're going to do some things. I'm going to make some announcements. I'm going to recognize these seniors tonight before we go. And uh, we're going to sing, but if you need to step out of your car and use this altar, you can. Um, you can pray where you're at. It really doesn't matter. Um, if you need somebody to pray with you, there's somebody here that will pray with you. we got folks that will pray over you and pray with you. Um, so you just mind the Lord and be obedient.
thank you, thank you, thank you for singing and playing tonight. Um, at this time, what we're going to do before we get ready to close, there's some folks I want to recognize. Some things we need to do at the end of this. This is our last chapel service of the year, and it has been a unique chapel service. But well, the first thing I want to do is all my seniors here at Mount Pleasant, I want you to come up here and get on the stage for me if you don't mind. Uh, just come on up here. You're a senior. Uh, where are we at? There are they. Are we missing one? Two. We're missing two. Paige and uh, Paige and Hayden. They may be small in number from some people's perspective, but uh, they're enough to deal with. I can promise you that. Um, to say that this group has been a blessing is uh, uh, has been it would be an understatement. Um, Allison, of course, has uh, has been here with us. Her and Will, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, I guess the uh, <laughs> uh, the relentlessness of a mother wanting us to have a high school here. Uh, Blessed us with some kids that I'll ever, I'll forever be grateful that they've been in my life. And uh, then down a few years right after they came, here comes Alex and Kayla. Um, Alex has grown so much. God has called him to preach. And he's pursuing ministry with his life. And... Um, so proud of and uh, what has been a great relationship between a student and a, a pastor as Alex and I have had many many talks on Wednesday mornings just to let he's allowed him and his parents has trusted me and I had to give me an opportunity to spend time discipling and talking about the Word of God on Wednesday mornings and it's been it's been amazing to watch him grow from 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 what he what he was to what he is now and what he's about to become, and I'm very proud of him. Kayla has some people would think that Kayla's really quiet, so you get around her really good. Her teacher in class, and then she's not very quiet. She's been ever so faithful, just as constant and steady as she could be, and uh, she's been here basically from the beginning of the high school, from the get go, and. Uh, this is a special group. Trevor, most people would think Trevor's been with us forever because he acts like he has. I mean, he just walked right in here this past year and just jumped in, and you would have thought he'd, uh, if there was no fish out of water or anything like that, he just, I, I've never seen a kid or a young man rather come into a situation like he did and just blossom and just fit right in and, and Usually sometimes like that, it's difficult. The transition is difficult. But Trevor's been here with us this year and uh, has brought nothing but joy and laughter into, into our school. And uh, there, the one thing I can tell you about Trevor is if he's thinking it, he's going to say it. However he feels like it's coming. That's the way it's coming out of his mouth. Whether he likes my, whether he likes what we're doing or not, he's going to let you. You will never have to know what he's feeling about the situation. So we're missing two, Paige and Haley. And uh, I'm going to say this. Haley's not here, so I'm going to pick on her just a little bit. Haley is my crier. There has never been a math test given in my presence that Haley has not cried through. Uh, and uh, I'm going to miss them greatly. And Paige as well. Been here for a long time and has been such a such a big part of this school. We've had Wheels graduated from here and he still, he, he, he won't leave us. He just still stays here, plays the guitar. Um, and he'll be going to Auburn this fall, am I right? And uh, headed off to Auburn. War Eagle. Praise God. Yes. He's going to God's country, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, Anyway, uh, we're we're thankful for him, and him still while he's been at Snead, still coming. Every, 
I don't think there's been a chapel this past year, or in the past two years rather, that he's missed hardly. He's still been here playing the guitar for us ever. Uh, even works his schedule out so he can come help us out. He's He's been great, but I'm so grateful for these seniors and what they represent. And, I, and in one regard, I think some of this got slighted on them, but, uh, but it still doesn't make this group that much greater. And uh, I want everybody to give this group, we're going to, they're going to be graduating. We're going to give them, I told them, I promised them if I had to break every law in the, in the, in the state of Alabama to give them a graduation, I said, we're going to party like it's 1999 when we come out of this thing. And uh, they're going to graduate on June the 4th at 7 p.m. They've got their cap and gowns today. And uh, praise God, we're going to have a graduation ceremony for them. And uh, we're going to celebrate their achievements. And uh, I think all of them headed to college in some capacity. Where are you going, Alice? University of North Alabama, University of Mobile, Wallace State, Bell Haven. Uh, Haley, I think, is going to... Uh, Gadsden State, so uh, uh, these seniors are, are, are headed in the right direction, and I want us to pray over them tonight, and uh, uh, we're going to pray a blessing over their lives, and as they're getting ready to walk out of this chapter of their lives and walk into a new one, my prayer is this, is that the things that have been, in, the biblical things that we have worked hard to instill, I think the reading and writing and arithmetic always kind of takes care of itself. But I'm praying with all my heart that the things that they've learned biblically and spiritually through this experience will help guide them in their lives. And uh, so if you would pray with me over this group of seniors. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray a blessing over this group right now. Even the ones that are not able to make it tonight. I pray for protection. Not just physical protection, but spiritual protection over them. There is a wicked world that wants to rip them to pieces out there. And I pray with all my heart that you would keep them close to you and let them lean upon your strong arm. That they would keep you as the centerpiece of their life. And that you would let them focus completely on you. And God pass down godliness, holiness, and righteousness into their next generation. God, somewhere along the lines, they're going to find spouses. And I pray for their families. And I pray over their homes. I pray over their studies. That you would bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all give this group a hand clap. Let them know All right. One more thing before we dismiss. There is another person that is closing a chapter in her life. And I'm being the first one to tell you that I have... Uh, some of you already know it. Some of you have already heard this, but I'm going to. Uh, try. Miss Denise, will you come on up here? Get out of your car. We're going to break social distancing laws for just a minute. We're going to ask you to come out here for just a second. There's two people responsible for Mount Pleasant Christian School. God and Denise Smallwood. And the burden that she, that God gave this woman to walk through hell to make this thing happen is absolutely unreal. And I know that uh, these last, what, seven years, eight years now, we've been going into our eighth year, Eight years, we went from what, 15, 20 students to 165 students in just eight years. We're really only supposed to be in the eighth grade, going into the ninth grade, and now we're graduating our third group of seniors. This woman has tirelessly worked to make this ministry happen. She has been like a mother to the teachers here. Uh, she has put up with me over the last six, seven years now. Um, and um, she looked at me she's been telling me for several years that she's she, preparing my head for it and I, keep, I kept saying that it wasn't going to happen it wasn't going to happen she was going to live forever and, uh, but
But she looked at me this year and she said, it's time. And uh, she's not leaving entirely. She's still going to work with the preschools, uh, with the preschool area. And uh, she's still going to be here. Um, but uh, she has been nothing but faithful. She has been like a right arm to me as a pastor. And uh, sometimes I wonder how it feels because she kind of helped raise me as it is and uh, to have me as her pastor now. And that's got to be sometimes frustrating. But um, she's worked so well. She's been such a, such a blessing to this school and this place. And uh, Denise, I wanted to recognize you and just kind of make this announcement for you and let you know we appreciate you. And uh, uh, some of you are wondering uh, what's happening next. And I'll tell you this, that um, somebody that's been here from the beginning is going to fill her shoes and, and is going to move this thing and keep it moving. And uh, she's, she's got the heart to do it. She's got the love for this ministry to do it. Uh, Sybil Smith is going to be our school administrator moving forward into next year. And um, she, has, uh, she has already been a, a very strong leader in this school for many years already. And uh, I look forward uh, to working alongside of her in, these, in this ministry and seeing what God's going to do. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Denise, you wanna say anything? You wanna, I know. You know, when, you know when it's time to retire is when you have to ask people to help you upstairs. <laughs> you know it's time to retire. And so, um, I'll still be around. God's not gonna let me quit completely yet. I think Dan thought I'd die before I retired. I think that's really what he was thinking. Uh, but I'm showing him up, hopefully, for a few more years anyway. But this has been amazing. Um, I've seen God do things that have been miraculous. I've seen things behind the scenes that teachers don't see. And I've seen God, he's an all-time God, and I've seen him over and over how faithful he is. And I appreciate that song about faithfulness, because he is so faithful. And... Uh, He's been faithful to this school. This has probably been the worst year we have ever had. But you know what? We're still here. And we'll be here next year, Lord willing. And we're still going to be there for these kids to, to disciple them, to bring them up, to teach them about the Lord, to give them the right kind of spiritual foundation, because that's, that's what it's all about. Um... I love this place. I love you, Brother Dan, and your family. I love Lisa. And you couldn't ask for a better bunch of teachers. I mean, boys and girls, you have no idea how hard your teachers have worked over the last six to seven weeks. We didn't miss a beat. The minute we're out, we started planning, and they have worked so hard trying to keep you. Going. And I appreciate being more than you ever know. They are, they're awesome. And boys and girls, I think you just need to give them a hand. Praise right now, wherever you are. I'll still be around. Not going anywhere yet. Listen, I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to let Alex close out the prayer. And uh, once he finished pray playing, All right, all the little kids have got to come up here on the gravel right in front. Go all right. Uh, no. but, but while they're doing that, I'm going to let Alex play. I'm going to let our pray, not play, uh, even though he can play. Uh, but I'm going to let Alex pray for us, and uh, and then I'm going to get Will back up here. You've got to finish with what you started. I mean, it's, don't you think so, Miss Williams? Yeah, did, Will, do you agree? Good deal. And, and here's the other thing. We, 
We're going to keep the microphone and the Tucker. 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 So Tucker. that you can help her with a Wait, hand motion. Because that's the way we started. You had to teach it. Listen, we got to pass down something to the next generation. All right. Alex, I want you to pray for us. And the seniors are going to stay up here and help, too. But Alex. Tex. Tell Tex. He's not here. Dear God, I thank you for who you are, Lord. I thank you for allowing us to gather here in your name to be able to, um, to go to see, to praise you, to glorify you, Father. I pray that you would lead us to guys in everything you do, God. I pray that even though um, this is the end of the year and we have there, there's a lot more time until everyone comes back in the fall for school, Father, I pray that they would they would be focused on you, Father. They would realize that their time here is short, Father. That Anything they do here that's not for you, God, that it's worthless, that has no meaning, God, that it's it's the dust of the earth, Father. I pray that our lives would be centered around your gospel, sharing your gospel, that we would realize that there's nothing more important than people dying and burning in hell, Father. I pray that we would realize that you give us a call to spread your word, spread your truth. I pray that we would seek you with our full hearts, Father. I pray that you would lead us in guidance in which is name we pray. Amen. Tucker and Tex. Get up there. Get